Welcome to Distrust and Disparities, Dismantling Black Health Disparities podcast. We examine health disparities that disproportionately affect Black women and Black families. In addition, we amplify organizations and individuals working to dismantle racist health practices and systems to improve health outcomes for marginalized communities. I'm your host, Jasmine Moore, a registered nurse, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Camille White. We discuss domestic violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and other triggering topics in this episode. Listener discretion is advised. We just lost my nephew, so that speaks for itself. They should have never let him out. Everyone wants to sob and resign from their positions after this has happened. Like, nothing will bring Jaden Perkins back. Nothing is going to bring him back. But we will try to continue his legacy. In this episode, we discuss the devastating impact of domestic violence, especially in the Black community, and the heartbreaking murder of a child trying to protect their pregnant mother and younger sibling from an abusive ex-partner. And we highlight Ujima, the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community, an organization harnessing the power of collective action to cultivate a world where Black women and girls are celebrated and live free from violence. Welcome back to another episode of Distrust and Disparities. We are happy to be back. We know we took a long break, but we had time to rest, also explore some hobbies, and just... I would say relax (laughs) as much as we could was the priority. So we're happy to be back. We have uh, lots of amazing episodes coming up and we're excited to be here. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So we just wanted to make sure um, everybody is doing their monthly Uh, self-breast exams, and also, depending on your age and family medical history, please contact your primary care doctor about scheduling a mammogram. Also, remind the women in your life to check to make sure that they're getting regular mammograms as well. So this is a great month just to check in, just to make sure we're on track with things. You can also check out episode three, where we discuss Erica Hart's story with battling breast cancer and episode 43, where we interview Jasmine Samuel and discuss her story. October is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we felt that it was very important to discuss the seriousness of domestic violence and gender-specific violence. Recently, Diddy has been in the news for his horrific and horrendous crimes. And honestly, I do not like how the conversation has been going surrounding all the events. When Cassie first filed her lawsuit, there were a lot of people, particularly Black men, saying, oh, she just wants money. Why is she just coming out now? And there was a lot of doubt surrounding um, her case and the allegations. And people were just had like a lot to say. And it wasn't positive. And then when the video of Diddy came out physically assaulting Cassie, everyone was shocked. But there was still talk of, you know, why did she wait so long? It was still more victim blaming and questioning. And more people started to come out about um, Diddy and uh, abuse, more abuse allegations. And most recently, the feds... um, took him in. He was arraigned on several counts of abuse, including sex trafficking and racketeering, and just a whole lot of egregious crimes and abuse. But now I'm seeing just like a bunch of people, mostly men, just making funny reels and TikToks about the situation. And It's not really funny. You know, these are victims that this went on for years, basically Mm -hmm. out in the open, like men and women were abused and sexually trafficked. And 
I just don't like how just the way everything is going down. Like we really need to have a serious conversation about the way our community handles domestic violence, sexual assault, rape. It needs to be taken serious, you know, so that these things don't happen. Because when doing research for this episode, there's so many cases of domestic violence and sexual assault that we could use for this episode. It's just sad. And I think... Too many times people just like their natural response when something makes them uncomfortable is to try and make something funny. But like Mm -hmm. this isn't funny in any way, shape or form. And people need to stop always going to victim blaming of like, why did it take so long for someone to come forward? Why? Like because time and time again, our community, our society, this country proves that you do not believe victims. Mm -hmm. You question them about what they were doing instead of looking into what the perpetrator did. And people don't come forward because, oh, I don't know, someone has millions and millions of dollars and is able to buy the silence of others who are a witness to it. They're able to pay people off. So when, you know, it, it just sucks that like, That is always what people focus on. And I think it needs to start as early as possible when it comes to our younger generations of teaching them that like it doesn't matter when you are able to come forward. Coming forward should never be seen as like, oh, you're just looking for money. You're looking for this, that Mm -hmm. you're looking for in some sort of way justice for yourself for other victims and, you know, you should be supporting anyone who comes forward and it should be investigated seriously mm-hmm. and stop with the jokes. It's not funny because that's what allows it to continue to happen. And it allows horrible people to know that they can get away with it and that they can continue to do this stuff because it's not really taken seriously. Yes. And there needs to be more um, education tar- targeted towards men and boys. Like I was looking into it. Like, is there a program that specifically works with um, boys and things like that. And there was only one program. It's like a new campaign to, you know, changing, you know, the ideas around like masculinity and what it is to be like a man. And then it was like one program I found, but it was like a court mandated program for um, domestic violence offenders. And most people that went to the program, they were mandated, but there's no other real talk about it. I feel like men should be having these conversations in the barbershop. They should be, they should be the ones like speaking up when they see Mm -hmm. the men in their life showing abusive behaviors, um, or, you know, just the way they act and things like that. There needs to be more things targeting men because it's all, everything is like, you know, women, you have to like protect yourself, you know, watch what you're wearing, watch your drink, watch how late you go out and stuff like that is all these protective measures. But what about men like preventing them from becoming abusers themselves and rapists and things like, I feel like something needs to be done on that forefront. And also like in the community, because we're going to highlight some statistics. So domestic violence can be really complex in the black community According to the 2010-2012 National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, nationally, 45% of Black women experience contact sexual violence, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. The survey found that 40% of Black men experience contact sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. They kind of group these categories together. And according to the 2011 National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, approximately 41% of Black women have experienced physical violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime, compared to 31% of white women 30% of Hispanic women, and 15% of Asian or specific Islander women. Black women compromise 14% of the U.S. population and 31% 
of domestic violence fatalities and are statistically nearly three times more likely than white women to be killed by an intimate partner. Black women are twice as likely to be shot and killed by an intimate partner in comparison to white women. Those statistics are scary. Like when you just look at it and just read it out loud, like this is, you know, seems like the norm. It's almost like maybe if it breaks down, like maybe like one in five women. If you look at like the people in your family, the women in your family, I bet somebody has been you know, Mm -hmm. have a history of domestic violence or abuse in their lifetime. And I just want to read this quote. It says, not only do Black women face some of the highest rates of domestic violence in the country, Black women experience the public stigma, silence, and victim blaming that surrounds domestic violence. And it's magnified by a complex history of oppression, over-policing, and discrimination. As a result, Black survivors experience compounding barriers to safety, to asking for help, and to receiving help when it's asked for. That quote alone, it just summarizes everything. It's like a complex situation. A lot of women are in need, but then there's so many barriers to getting help and getting the help in a timely manner. And the story that we're going to discuss today kind of highlights this situation, these statistics specifically. And before we move on to our main story, I just want to point out the abuse hotline. Please call the confidential 24-hour national domestic violence hotline at one 800 799-7233. Have you checked out our website? There you can find all of our episodes and show notes. You can even listen directly on the site and catch up on any previous episode you may have missed. You can read our bios and see what we're up to. Also, we made it even easier to contact us. Just fill out the form on our homepage and click submit. We invite you to recommend guests and topics we should feature. So what are you waiting for? Go check us out at distrustanddisparities.com. For our main story, we want to highlight the tragic killing of 11-year-old Jaden Perkins. Jaden was tragically stabbed to death defending his pregnant mom against ex-boyfriend Crosetti Brand. And before we jump into the events leading up to his death, we just wanted to highlight Jaden and just his personality. People had wonderful things to say about him. The 11-year-old was a rising star and he had a very promising future. Jaden attended the Helen C. Pierce School of International Studies, a Chicago public elementary school. And teachers, they described him as having an exceptional work ethic combined with a consistent smile that filled every room. Jaden was an exceptional young man respected by his peers, and admired by his teachers. He excelled academically, earning straight A's, and consistently making the honor roll. He was also deeply involved in extracurricular activities, participating in cross-country, football, and the arts. Jaden had a passion for performing and theater. He had the lead role in several plays, including Finding Nemo at his elementary school. In addition to his academic and artistic talents, Jaden was known for his leadership qualities and compassionate nature. He was always willing to lend a helping hand and had a knack for resolving conflicts among friends. His positive energy and enthusiasm were contagious. But he just sounds like an amazing child and just looking at like the pictures and some of the videos of him he just looks so bright and vibrant on March 13 2024 Jaden's mom 
And we don't know her name because it's been withheld because she is a victim of domestic violence. So we'll refer to her as Jaden's mom. She was preparing to take Jaden and his uh, five-year-old brother to school. And according to prosecutors, Jaden's mother was on the phone with her mother while helping her two sons get ready for school. As she unlocked her door to leave, her ex-boyfriend, Crosetti Brand, forced his way inside and attacked her with a knife. Police responded to 911 calls around 8 a.m., discovering both 11-year-old Jaden and his 33-year-old mom with stab wound injuries after being attacked. Both Jaden and his mom were transported to St. Francis Hospital, and this is in um, Illinois. Jaden's mom had multiple stab wounds, and at the time of the stabbing, she was eight months pregnant, but she and her unborn child survived the attack. However, Jaden suffered a single stab wound to the chest and was pronounced dead. Jaden died attempting to protect his mom and younger brother. Jaden's mom had a long history with Crosetti Brand, dating back more than 15 years. And in that history, she was trying to protect herself from him after dating him so long ago. So court records show that Brand had four orders of protection filed against him from four different women dating back to 2004. And again, this horrible incident happened in 2024. His rap sheet goes back to the early 2000s. And most of those previous cases involved domestic battery. So he is well known, or at least should be, in the criminal justice system to law enforcement as someone who is violent towards his intimate partners. Mm -hmm. So in 2013, Brand pleaded guilty to charges of domestic battery for punching another woman who had recently ended a relationship with him. And the punch was hard enough to knock her unconscious and leave her bleeding from the mouth. Now we go four years in 2017, Brand was sentenced to 16 years in prison for a 2015 home invasion involving one of the women who had an order of protection. And in that case, court records show, quote, he forced his way into the apartment of his former girlfriend, then attacked the girlfriend and threatened her 15 year old son, then put a gun to the girlfriend's chin, pushed her up against the wall and began choking her. Jeez. Just violent, just a violent person. After serving about eight years in prison, because remember, he had 16 years. That was what he was sentenced to in 2017. He received parole in October 2023 with electronic monitoring. So I remember when I read this, it was just like, you you got to be kidding me. What is this nonsense? Right. How is he allowed to get out? Like he did something horrendous and he only got half of what he was sentenced to. Well, Illinois law, offenders of certain crimes only have to do half of the time to which they're sentenced. For the other half of their sentence, they can be released for good behavior. And... <sighs> It, there's so many things to it because, again, like, what is considered the certain crime that you're allowed to only do half? Like, what 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 are the categories? Because you literally threatened a former girlfriend who broke up with you and her child who was 15 years old. How is that? Oh, but you were so good in prison, so we'll just give you half? Exactly. And he did so with a gun and entered their home forcibly. Like there's so many things to what he did where it's just like, I don't get how that qualifies for the, oh, you go half these, you go half these in prison and have these electronic monitoring. Right. <laughs> and I think in Illinois, when I was like reading like the article, I think it's only murder where you're mandated to serve like the full time. But mm. if you almost kill somebody, Certain crimes, I feel like you should have to serve the full time. Or, you know, you would think 
with our criminal justice system, we are providing rehabilitation so that people can be reacclimated into society, but we're not doing that. And the system no. is is not helping those that are imprisoned and is not helping victims at all. With being released on parole in October 2023, while out, he then threatened Jaden's mom via text and also showed up at her home. He rang the doorbell multiple times and tried to pull the door handle out of the door. And Jaden's mom contacted the parole board and he was sent back to prison, according to prosecutors. And that was in... February 2024 for his parole violation. And then court records showed that Jaden's mother went to court on February 21st, 2024, requesting an emergency order of protection for harassment, physical abuse, and stalking. And she expressed her fear saying the man, quote, sent me several text messages saying he would kill me and my family. He would wait outside my house and shoot me. I have pics. Um, She added also to the emergency order request that she wanted protection, quote, for my safety, for him to stay away from me and my apartment and my children. But unfortunately, the judge denied the emergency order, saying the mother presented insufficient evidence of an emergency, which I am so confused again about what you mean by insufficient evidence like. He went to her home and has texted her. The text messages honestly would be enough, even if he didn't show up at the house. Yeah. And he's violating his parole by doing the same thing he went to prison for. Exactly. That makes no sense. And I was like confused. I was like, what's the difference between a regular restraining order and like an emergency petition for a restraining order. So she already had a restraining order in place against brand. So there was already one in place. So she went in to put in an emergency petition because he's violating his parole. Like she was the one who notified his parole board that, Hey, he's violating his parole. He's not supposed to have contact with me. He's not supposed to, be anywhere near me and my children. So she put that in place. So she's going to the judge like, hey, he needs to stay in prison. You know, he needs to complete those eight years, the remaining eight years of his sentence because he's getting out and he's doing the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And the judge further noted as to why, you know, it was insufficient evidence and stuff and it wasn't an emergency was that, well, Brand was already in prison and it wasn't an emergency at that point where it's just like he was in prison because she contacted the parole board to put him back in prison. Like, what are y'all not understanding where it's like you should have all the information possible about this man in front of you when someone is coming to you that already has a protection order against them and is looking to like bump it up even more. You shouldn't just be going off of, well, he's already in prison for exactly what she's telling you about, which is an emergency. Right. She's putting this emergency petition in place because she knows he's eventually going to be released again on parole. And he's going to do the same thing. Like, I don't get why he's not taking these threats seriously. It makes no sense. And the judge did not in any way inquire about why Brand was in custody or when he might be able to be released because of this, you know, parole violation. So while the judge denied the emergency order, the case was continued until March 13th for a hearing on a regular order protection. So basically it was like, oh, it's not an emergency. We'll just wait a little, a couple of weeks into March, and then we'll do this case. Well, Brand was released from prison the day before he was to appear in court. So that would be March 12th, he was released. Mm. And on Wednesday morning, March 13th, as Jaden's mother was ready to step before a judge again at 9 a.m. for that order of protection, police say that he showed up and he stabbed her and killed her son. You literally released this man. 
the day before she was supposed to go and get an order of protection. I'm assuming like maybe he was notified about it. I have no idea. But like you literally released the person who had threatened her right before she was trying to get another layer of protection against him. Like, I don't know. Is this stupidity? Is this just like complete like negligence? Like, what is this? Because I don't I don't know how anybody in their right mind would do this. You're literally going like, oh, go ahead and just go and attack her. Right. It makes no sense. Yeah. It's basically saying we can't do anything until, you know, he attacks you. And that's ridiculous. The system is not designed to protect victims at all. But I bet you if she was to go and attack him to protect her kids, like one of the previous cases we discussed, Marissa Alexander, she would be in prison. She would be locked up and fighting for her life. You know, it's mm-hmm. it shouldn't have to come down to this. She went, she's following the system, asking for emergency position because he is threatening her. And the judge is basically like, he's already in prison. Like, it's nothing to worry about, but he's going to get out. Why are we, why is the case... Why was it pushed back until after he is released? So he had less than a day and he was, you know, less than a day from he was released. And then that morning he went and assaulted her and killed her son. That's all it took. That little bit of leeway that he was out and he did it again. Like his behavior just escalated. This should not happen. Like, When you say sometimes victims are afraid to become forward, it's because of situations like this where more harm is done. This mom, she has to deal with the death of her child and raising her younger son who witnessed the crime. It's just so sad. It really is. And after this happened, the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, they're the one who let Brand out on parole again, said that they did not know the order of protection was filed when they released Brand. I don't get how they don't know this. Like, you should know he has four active restraining orders. You see that he violated his parole. Like, you should have this information And in the weeks following Jaden's death, two of the members of the prison review board, they stepped down, including the lead reviewer of the case. Because you really dropped the ball, and this led to Jaden's death. And I also then questioned, too, where it's just like, I don't know the workload that someone in this position has, where, again... it's a failing on so many levels. It's a failing of like, what was the judge doing? It's a failing of this uh, parole board and the provision. Like, what were y'all doing where y'all would even let him out? There's so many failings and I don't want to just blame one person, but because a lot of times when you're in these sort of roles and jobs, you're overworked and things can easily fall through the cracks because you're one, not really paid that well, but two, you have the workload of basically four different people and you're expected to, you know, manage thousands of cases when that's literally impossible and things like this happen. But mm-hmm. that's why like so much needs to be changed and it, it really people really need to understand that like you can't let things slip through the cracks because Mm -hmm. this is the result in a situation like this this is the result and it's such an unfortunate result but there were also other people along the way that could have prevented this Mm -hmm. absolutely and i was reading an article it was like the mayor of illinois he was like this is a rare incident that happened you know But how many times has this happened, but it's gone under the radar because uh, victims don't come forward and report people that are getting out? Maybe the law needs to change those committed of, you know, multiple counts of domestic violence and abuse. They should not qualify for this, you know, serving half of their time. Maybe we need to reevaluate the law. 
and criminal justice reform, there's a whole thing that needs to be done on that. I'm just thinking about how um, the guy on death row, there was so much evidence that came forth that he didn't do the crime, but he was still executed. And just the system has so many cracks. It's just like, it's disheartening. Like, how do we fix it? It's just like, we're just doing patchwork of just like a broken system. And we say all the time, a system that is not designed for us is not designed for victims at all. Not at all. Because yeah, in that, in that situation, Khalifa Williams, he, he was executed by the state of Missouri and they're a state that makes it their business to execute you, whether you innocent or not. And that's again, where part of it is, we need to, I think anyone going yes, death penalty needs to really reevaluate and understand that so many innocent people are murdered by execution. Mm -hmm. And we can't continue to murder people if we're not a thousand percent sure that they did something and we're not even asking for that in this situation we just asking y'all to hold him inside for a little bit longer and people evaluate the situation and go oh no 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 he don't need to be out because he didn't he been let out and he done done the same thing over and over again and like you said before looking at are we really rehabilitating people mm-hmm. or are we just looking at a punish them throw them away for several years and then bring them back out into society and like, we'll see what happens. But like a lot of times what happens is people fall into doing the same things they've done before. And this person is a very violent person that immediately uh, with the quickness, like this is all he knows how to do went and harmed someone yet again, a a previous victim of his. And it's just, like you said, it's disheartening. And there's so much that we need to be doing collectively as a community to really, uh, work on changing this and there's so much you know the state level that needs to be done too yeah Christetti brand was charges include first degree murder attempted first degree murder armed robbery home invasion and domestic battery and his trial began um this summer and he is defending himself um that's pretty much the the last little note we have on him and as for uh Jaden's family the Perkins family of course they're angry they're devastated about you know how this attack happened and they say that the system failed them and it did and it failed them because it allowed Brand to be released from prison on parole and the family they're hoping Jaden's legacy can lead to some policy changes when it comes to domestic violence cases And Jaden's aunt stated, quote, the simple fact that the system has failed my sister and our family and that my 11 year old nephew had to be murdered behind this is just crazy. We want better prevention and protection. I can't bring my nephew back, but maybe it will save someone else. Mm -hmm. And the family, they want to create what is called Jaden's law, where there is better communication between, you know, victims of domestic violence and parole boards and courts where there is clear communication and everyone involved understands what is happening. And it's not this weird compartmentalized piecemeal thing of like one side over here knows one thing, one side over here knows another thing, because that what it, was what it was. Information was not shared as it should have been. And he was released when like maybe if they had known, he never would have been let out. Mm-hmm. Additionally, there is a petition that they have started. Uh, Jaden's um, aunt started on change.org to get this law, Jaden's law passed. And you can find that in our show notes and then also on our social media. If you are enjoying this episode, you should consider buying us a coffee. Yes, a coffee. That small gesture will help us continue to create quality episodes and content. Click the buy me a coffee link in the show notes or check out our website at distrustanddisparities.com.
And now we want to segue into highlighting an organization that is working to tackle issues such as domestic violence. We want to highlight the organization Ujima, the National Center on Violence Against Women and the Black Community. It was established in 2015. The center addresses the pervasive issues of sexual assault and domestic violence and community violence within the Black community. Rooted in the third principle of Kwanzaa, Ujima embodies the commitment to collective work and responsibility. As an organization, they embrace this guiding principle, recognizing its transformative power to mobilize and uplift our communities from within. Through research, policy, programming, and engagement efforts, they're able to harness the power of collective action to drive meaningful change. And the mission of Ujima is to inspire and support the Black community in responding to and preventing domestic violence and community violence and sexual assault. They focus on collective responsibility and shared prosperity. And they strive to cultivate a world where Black women and girls thrive. They pursue this mission by leveraging their resources, expertise, and networks to build a brighter future for generations to come. I like this organization because they're focused on a community effort. And just reading through some of their resources, they really focus on being trauma-informed and looking at uh, some of the roots of domestic violence, recognizing the complex history, but working together as a community to make women and girls feel safe, that it takes a community effort to make the change that once, that they want to see. And some of Ujima's programs include um, the National Center for Culturally Responsive Victim Services, Enhancing the Capacity of Black Culturally Specific Providers, CSSPTA. They also have HBCU Training and Technical Assistance Initiative. And I was looking at the technical assistance. They help people who receive funding and grants, and they help them to make sure that they're providing like culturally specific care and the safest support for victims and creating like the best environments for them. Other programs include domestic violence fatality review teams, which ensure culturally specific responses and firearms and technical assistance projects. So when we highlight in the beginning, black women are three times more likely to be um, killed, especially with gun violence from an intimate partner. So really looking at these statistics and figuring out a way to prevent more women and girls from being killed. There's multiple ways to support you can, one, you can go to their website, check out their resources. You can sign up for their um, newsletter to receive more information, um, engage with them on social media. You can follow them and like their posts and share their posts. Additionally, you can go to their website and you can donate to them so that they can support more programs and create more policy and change to do the work that they're doing. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Do you have recommendations for topics we should discuss about health disparities or injustices? Guests we should interview doing amazing health justice work? Or organizations we should highlight creating positive change for marginalized communities? Please visit us at distrustanddisparities.com or email us at distrustanddisparities at gmail.com. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank you.